you're probably wondering why I'm talking right now instead of the usual musical intro you're used to at the start of every new episode. Well, if you hadn't noticed, this is the start of season three of our show, and we wanted to do something a little special for you. That's right. And because this season opening episode is all about generative AI. You just gave away the topic. Yeah, I know, but we've been previewing it, so I figured it was okay. True, true. And since we didn't want you, our loyal show fans, to think that we created this episode using ChatGPT, Bing Chatter, Google Bard, we thought the most authentic way to do that was to talk to you first and preview the show. Right? I mean, if we'd have used ChatGPT or MidJourney to create this intro, you know it would be a lot better than what we're doing now. Maybe more dry, but... Uh, probably more interesting and maybe better capturing everyone's attention. I mean, if we had, you'd be seeing the two of us wearing some spectacular, crazy outfits and probably recording from some outlandish backdrop. Yeah, I'd be broadcasting from the beach and take the day off and let AI do it. R exactly. Yeah, right, right. And I would most certainly be recording from a racetrack somewhere in the driver's seat of a really stylish and blazingly fast Aston Martin or Lamborghini. Then it would just be fake. I really struggle with the new li line for reality. <laughs> there, there is that risk. Yes. It might look completely bizarre and totally out of place. But we want you, our fans, to know that we're way too original and authentic for that. Yes, exactly. We absolutely are. We would never fake that. But that said, if any of you out there would like to offer a recording setup from the driver's seat of an Aston Martin or a Lamborghini, I am 100% there for that. I actually might be able to help you there, Ricardo. <laughs> anyway, don't worry. It's not just going to be the two of us talking about imaginary sessions. We've got two amazing guests joining us today to keep us grounded. And if you didn't listen to or watch our season three trailer, you just might want to pause here and go do that now. You'll be glad you did. Otherwise, you won't know what the three themes are for the season. And you wouldn't know which theme we're jumping into today. So give it a listen and come back here and we'll move on into the intro music. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure this turned out to be special enough intro for season three. Yeah, there's always next time. We'll get the, the budget boosted for the next episode. Well, that's a thought. Um, not, not that our budget would allow for the cars I'm talking about, though. <laughs> enough of cars. <laughs> Let's get into the usual intro music. You're listening to the Retail Razor Show, where your expert hosts and their guests cast through the clutter in retail and retail tech to shape the future of retail. Hello and welcome to Season 3, Episode 1 of the Retail Razor Show. I'm your host, Ricardo Belmar. And I'm your co-host, Casey Golden. Welcome to the Retail Razor Show, retail's favorite podcast for product junkies, commerce technologists, and everyone else in retail and retail tech alike. Today, we are answering the most incredibly important question in retail that's on the tip of everyone's tongue. Exactly what can be done with generative AI in retail? What better way to kick off the new season? We'll be exploring the remarkable positives and potential drawbacks associated with this groundbreaking technology. So buckle up and get ready for an insightful ride into the realm of generative artificial intelligence. Yes, this is an awe-inspiring field. With generative AI, we're witnessing a paradigm shift in how we perceive and interact with technology. And now, I I've already said before in other places and, and been quoted saying it, that generative AI is the, the third major transformation of retail, with the first, of course, being the barcode. And the second, I would say, was the smartphone, more specifically the iPhone. I mean, you know, it's a monumental shift when you hear phrases like back in the pre iPhone era. And we're crossing that threshold now, I think, from the pre AI era to the, the AI era. Well, before we get into that, maybe we should give a quick intro to what we're doing this season. That's a great idea. If you listen to our season three trailer, then you already know that we're focusing on three themes this season. Number one, automation and AI. And number two, immersive commerce and anywhere commerce, and number three, back to basics of retailing. All three are so important to what's happening in retail right now. We decided to have all three of these because honestly, they're pretty connected to each other in so many ways, and we're going to explore that this season. 
Exactly. And we are starting that exploration this episode with the first theme, focusing on AI, specifically generative AI. So let's talk about our guests for the discussion. We have invited two superstars for this episode. Both are no strangers to the show and to our Clubhouse origins. With us today will be Michelle Bacharach, the CEO of FindMine, and Shish Tridar, Global Retail Lead at Microsoft for Startups. They're absolutely incredible. Just, they're truly more. D don't say it. Don't say it. This isn't that kind of episode. <laughs> You're right. But I just love how that kind of, you know, makes you jump. Well, on that note, uh, let's get to the main attraction this week, our discussion that hopes to answer exactly what can be done with generative AI and how it's impacting retail today. Welcome, everyone, to our first discussion in our automation and AI theme this season. We're diving into generative AI today and the tremendous impact it's having on the retail industry. And of course, we're going to talk about something with transformative impact and risk. We need to bring in right thought leaders to dig into this topic. So let's introduce them now. Well, when you're dealing with a brand new innovative technology, what's one of the first places you look for leading examples? Well, one of those has got to be startups, of course. And what better place to look than the Microsoft for Startups program? I mean, if we're talking generative AI, we all know we're going to end up talking about OpenAI and some of the Microsoft developments there anyway, so let's just go right to it. So joining us today is one of our own retail Avengers, Shish Tridar, Global Lead for Retail at Microsoft for Startups. Welcome, Shish. Good morning, and thank you, Ricardo and Casey. Great to be on the show. And Shish, it's been a while, I think, since we've had you on the show. In fact, I was looking back, and I, I think you were part of the season two Yep. Opening episode on the metaverse when you were last here. So it's kind of becoming a trend that we always have you come in on these big industry moments. I know. I know. Uh, this, is, this is another huge topic. I mean, this is a topic that I've been hearing from every major brand, and there's massive momentum in the startup world as well. So excited to be on the second big topic. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And now this discussion wouldn't be complete without a real world operator, someone who's recently and really tackling this in the trenches, working with retailers and who's lived the startup life, something I'm intimately familiar with. And you get to see a lot of really neat things before anybody is ever talking about them. Welcome, Michelle, CEO of FindMine. Hi, thanks for having me. Good to see you guys. And Michelle, you're no stranger to our past Clubhouse rooms, but this is your first time on the podcast. Welcome. That's right. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. So let's break down this discussion into three main areas. First, with the creative impacts on the consumer side of the business. Then we'll get into impact on business operations. And finally, we can't really have this conversation without talking about the risks. And there's certainly more to the topic than that, but I think we can ground ourselves in those three areas to start. Yeah, and, and let's put some additional context and definitions around this since we're, we're grounding ourselves here. We've talked before about how the impact of artificial intelligence, AI, could revolutionize the way businesses operate. For example, leveraging AI-driven data analytics to gain actionable insights into customer behavior, consumer preferences, and market trends. By analyzing this data, retailers can personalize marketing efforts, optimize pricing strategies, and enhance inventory management, ultimately driving sales and boosting revenue. That's right. So if we extend that understanding to the latest and greatest AI development that's really overtaking the news, filling our inboxes with updates and predictions, and sometimes some cautionary notes, it's got to be generative AI. AI that's capable of producing original and even artistic content, generating lifelike images and videos to music compositions to writing captivating stories and even developing innovative solutions with the source code that goes with it. And that's just scratching the surface. So let's start by talking about the, all of the commerce and retail implications that are, are happening today. Yeah, Michelle, since this is your day in, day out. I'd love to get you on your, your search in commerce and commerce and really where you see the greatest impact. Yeah, I think the topic of the definition is so interesting because this is something we, we go back and forth on internally in our own company all the time. So I actually asked ChatGPT3, because I'm cheap, I didn't pay for four, 
but I asked him to be free what is generative AI. And what it told me was generative AI refers to a branch of artificial intelligence that focuses on creating or generating new content, such as images, text, music, or even videos that is indistinguishable from content created by humans. And it went on a little bit beyond that. But I think what's so by that definition, Find Mine is generative AI. We've been doing this since 2016, using AI to make editorial and marketing content around products that is dynamic. It's created within that one Mississippi millisecond that you've been accounting as the page is loading. It's dynamic. It's pulling in real-time inventory information, margin information, all this kind of stuff to produce the content into a, like a style guide or a lookbook or whatever. So, and we have a hundred million shoppers a month seeing that content. So we've been doing this for a while. What I think is interesting though, is the practical definition that's kind of coalesced around by most people today for generative AI is that it's synonymous with large language models, or even more specifically, it's like literally synonymous with ChatGPT and forget about anyone else who's doing it, right? So I think yeah. it's interesting depending on who you talk to, how you define it. But depending on how you define it, the applications are, are more numerous or less, right? But with large language models specifically, anything that has to do with like wisdom of the crowds, eating the whole internet, digesting it and giving a response is fair game and a great use case and application for Gen AI. But what FindMind does is actually very dangerous to brands to eat the whole internet and give a wisdom of the crowd's response. Because Nike, Adidas, Lululemon, like Under Armour all look the same. If it's a wisdom of the crowd's response, their differentiation comes from the brand. It comes from their point of view and their aspirational vision for their consumer. So I think it's incredibly important when we're working with large brands and retailers who have that differentiation and should have that differentiation in order to compete and thrive and stuff like that, that they're not exclusively using wisdom of the crowds based solutions, that they're actually taking a much more nuanced approach. And find mine, if you don't put us already squarely in the generative AI bucket, you would put us in the bucket of necessary adjunct to make sure that the generative AI, when I use it to produce content, doesn't take my brand and make it this generic commoditized thing. I think that that's a really good point, and it's something that I haven't seen heard anybody talking about. Um, mm -hmm. I'm the last person that would ever agree that people should be dressing themselves, right? I mean, I just I believe in experts, I believe in specialists, and I believe that it's very difficult for people to come out of their own their own like skin and to amplify their awesomeness. And I would just hate to see what <laughs> what these brands would look like if they ate the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's like percent off of like consumer behavior because yeah. I think we all know in commerce, part of that is sharing what people should buy. Yeah, on. I think it's like what we were talking about at the beginning before we started recording around like the death of expertise. Right. Like mm -hmm. social media made a doctor who's been through 16 years of training have the same voice or less amplification than an influencer with absolutely no medical training whatsoever saying drink yeah. celery dude gonna cure your cancer and like eating their eating the internet does that it, it collapses yeah. expertise and so i think brands because they rely so much on that expertise to differentiate have to be incredibly careful about how they're using these technologies for consumer facing things internal facing things like writing product copy and stuff maybe maybe they can get away with that a little bit more without that brand lens but for things that go directly to the consumer, they have to be incredibly careful because otherwise, one, two, three, four years from now, they could become completely commoditized because they rush to jump in on this Gen AI trend before thinking critically about how they need to apply it to their business. Yeah, I think that kind of is a good bridge for you, Sheesh. You're working with a lot of startups over at Microsoft in, in this space. And how are you guys looking at guiding the founders through identifying their products and, and hitting the market? So there, one, there is a lot of excitement that's happening in the startup world around the possibilities with generative AI. And, and there was a lot of caution that Michelle pointed out too as well in using generative AI. And in, really, in order to do that, one aspect of it is there is the reinforcement learning, human feedback aspect of it, where there is fine tuning and guardrails that are in place for ensuring that it's constantly being fine-tuned and checked and all of that. But there is a lot of human interface for that to happen. 
At the same time, I think the other aspect that, that I absolutely love about generative AI and the way to use it is the co-pilot aspect of it, where you're not taking the information and using it as an autonomous system, but rather you're using the information to assist what you're doing, to guide what you're doing and base off, off of that. The, I wouldn't actually even signal the depth of expertise at this point, mainly because to be able to use generative AI, and again, as Michelle pointed out, it is trained on the wisdom of crowds, and that is not a highly reliable system at all. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when you're using generative AI, you're accelerating the work, the repetitive work that you're doing with the, the abilities that generative AI provides, and then building off of that. What it really does for a lot of startups is how do you accelerate the work that you already do? How do you remove the repetitive nature of some of the things that you, that you indulge in? And, and that is, I think, really where generative AI, at least its current form, helps in. And I don't believe we're at a stage where it is, it can be treated as completely autonomous and, and can deliver on a lot of things unsupervised till all of that fine tuning is in place and all of that. So many of the startups that are working with generative AI are kind of using it as an accelerator rather than as a replacement for, for humans in a lot of things. So kind of going along those lines, wouldn't we expect then that if I'm a if I'm a major brand, someone like Michelle's examples before, like a Nike or a Lululemon, if I want to leverage that accelerative capability, rather than taking just a large model that's based on that, the internet crowd, let's call it, you'd really want it to be trained on your own content, right? And your own designs and your own information, maybe supplemented with some of that crowdsourced design, but you really want it to focus in on, here's the vast history of everything we as Nike or Lululemon or anybody else have ever designed. I've ever created, use that to help me create something new as an example. Yeah, I think that I think that what you just said is a massive undertaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. It's the the promise of Gen AI, like let's just take ChatGPT as it as a specific example. The promise of ChatGPT is massive. It's incredible. And it the promise is reducing manual effort, reducing the number of hours, getting more with less, getting further, faster. All those things are amazing. But what you just said, Ricardo, shifts a lot of the like manual work now to a different set of people instead of copywriters to mm -hmm. data laborers and to people who can write those prompts. One of the one of the guys from Hugging Face, which is another big open AI kind of competitor, what, when he was talking about on a podcast and of generative AI, he kept saying the word carefully crafted prompts, carefully crafted prompts. And I thought mm. that was more interesting because yeah. garbage it out. That's right. If you don't yeah. know how to write those prompts or feed the engine with what is that history of Nike or whatever it is, you're going to get garbage out. And again, these brands can't risk getting garbage out or you get garbage out and then you have a whole bunch of humans in the loop. So you're just shifting the work from one place to another place to another place. And that's why I feel like so strongly that companies like Find Mine have this vital role to play so that. You can take your big brand information, flow it through Find Mine, have the prompts be correct. Now you get the promise out of Dolly and Diffusion and all the different places that like that promise wouldn't accrue to you whatsoever if you didn't have these other kind of components in the mix. So it's not just because now all of a sudden this is available to you, you're going to save hundreds of thousands of man hours, person hours. You're not. You're just going to shift it somewhere else unless you have these other component people. In the yeah. Yep. I think that's a really good point on the direct-to-consumer tech stack, on all of the software companies that are going to be applying any type of AI that has one brand as a vendor. That could be potentially 16 generative AI sets that are talking to different data sets for one brand. I think it's going to be really interesting to kind of see how how software starts playing nicely together. I think that this will lead to a lot more vertical SaaS platforms mm -hmm. where context is king and a lot more yeah. category specific 
software tools or options to pick your category or your market at like the setup phase. Otherwise, what works for retail is not going to work for healthcare. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious what everybody thinks. If I I take some of what are, I'm just going to list a few use cases which are are, also been in the news or been reported on that there are lots of other potential vendors creating and such, but things like personalizing product descriptions, for example, or, or actually writing product descriptions to begin with, right? If you have a large e-commerce catalog and you want to create unique product pages, right, for 50 different variations of something, using this technology to create the copy for all of those things as one example. Then there's the ability to localize, for example, language translation, right? You want diff- you want to automate automate the way of having your product pages available in 20 different languages, for example, and using this technology. So I'll, there's just a couple of examples, right? Ones that are, are, I think, being given pretty frequently now as potentially a quick hit kind of use for this technology. But if you think about that, in the context of everything we just discussed, right? Is that, I don't know that I consider that to be more in the co-pilot side of usage as much as full-on automation of an existing task that I'm trying to take the person out of the task. Now, so I'm curious what everybody thinks of those two examples. And if it were you, how would you go about using it? So the, the way I see it, I think initially it will be a co-pilot kind of task where, you know, the, the product descriptions, the personalized marketing, all of that could be generated. And here you're using a combination of things. One is the personal information from your CRM, all of that. If I want to create a product description or a marketing copy that is very personalized for you, based on your past behavior, based in, on everything I know about you. Generating that, I would, most brands, my recommendation anyway, is to use the co-pilot approach first to ensure that there isn't any major issues with the copy that is being created. We, we have so many different stories of things in the past where there is automated marketing tools that have created blunders in the past. And I think those can repeat themselves in the generative AI world as well. And those can harm brands more than they can help. And, and from that perspective, I would say the initial part of it is co-pilot. And then once the, the system has been trained, it can go autonomous at some point. And that, that's what I feel. Yeah, I think that's probably where I come down on it too, Shish. I think that if anyone has, has ever been a native speaker of a language, and then you like see something that's nope. translated from another language and you're like, what? That's just wrong. You knew right away. You know right away it was translated. Well, right away. Like that yep. smell tap, those little contextual cues can just, you know, like make your hair stand on end when it's wrong. Like <laughs> I think that that's a really good like analogy for this paradigm that we're in, where like you just absolutely need the co pilot just to make sure you're catching those things. There's a TED talk that came out about a month ago by a professor of AI at the University of Ten called why AI is incredibly smart and shockingly stupid. And yep. I thought that was you know, like the title alone, like you know, <laughs> it's spot on. But the I would encourage people to watch the TED talk because it's it's full of these anecdotes and examples that are just like, yeah, well, there is no common sense. Like there's yep. just these gaps in sort of conventional human reason that AI doesn't have. But solving that is incredibly challenging. And so I think that any one of those things where those little cues. If they're wrong, just like make your hair stand up, yeah. that's going to require a co-pilot. And it's going to take a long time before those are training wheels free <laughs> and able to kind of run on their own. But particularly in the domain of language, I think that's so important if you're representing it as something that was was curated by a human and it's actually curated by created by a machine, there's no room for it. There really yeah. isn't. A lot of the yeah. stuff that happens like internal only until it's ready for prime time. A hundred percent. And something that we did in retail that I feel there are still a lot of brands who are guilty of this is putting social media managers and social media employees as like interns and like lowest hanging fruit. I feel like there is a risk that we're going to put, they're going to do the same thing with, prompt mm-hmm. engineers as yeah. the new interns right. Right. and uh, moving that expertise right. down to the very beginning of that cycle of entering a brand in the workforce, which I think we've seen a decade's worth of proof that social media managers, <laughs> it is a job. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah. <laughs> Probably have somebody with experience. Yeah, and, that's, and that's the key piece right there, right? The, the experience. I mean, I, I, can, I find it interesting that we, we, these conversations happen and there's sort of an assumption that because we're suddenly introducing a machine to it, that we're just going to let it loose unsupervised. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. you know, when we had humans doing this, we felt the need to supervise. And we felt that it was, it, there needed to be a review process. It had right. to be approved before it was released. And now magically we're expecting that because we're putting a machine yeah. process, exactly. it's infallible and, and requires no review or approval. And where I would look at that and say, well, why, even if you, you accept that maybe that machine process is replacing a human, it's doing it in one step of the process, maybe, maybe multiple steps, but it's not replacing the entire process. Or at least why would you think it is? It, it's kind of, it, I love the social media example. Casey's right. If we've seen so many brands get into hot water in the past from errant social media posts that someone should have reviewed and said, no, 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 not putting yep. that out there. Why would we not do the same and review what the machine creates in exactly. any of these examples? Right. Because we're talking, if you're an e-commerce brand and it's your product page, that's your revenue source. So why would you leave that up to an unsupervised process, whether it's human or machine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, to see it undervalued, just because nobody wants to bother with it. So yeah, like, right, be right. on the cheap. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting on different ways that businesses implement it into their their everyday ops. Yeah, yeah. How about another use case here that that's very consumer facing? That's we'll call it summarization. We've seen lots of great examples of generative AIs taking a lot of information, a lot of data. And doing a good job summarizing it. So to, in my mind, an, an automatic use case for that is anything that has a lot of customer reviews, right? If you're like most consumers and you see something has 15,000 reviews, well, you're not going to sit down and read all 15,000 reviews, right? You're going to be selective and you're going to hope that you pick the right five or six reviews that yeah. you look at to help you make a decision. So what if there was a way to make that process better? Yeah. I, I think, go on, Michelle. Oh, no, I was just going to say that I think that's a great use case. I, you just always have to fact check it. And the hallucinations are, are really hilarious. Like I use a audio call recording and it'll summarize next steps, pain points. Usually it's pretty accurate. But one of the next, one of the pain points, I was just like, what call was it listening to? Like literally just hallucinated and made shit up about like this other person on the call saying that they're, they're kind of flaky. So don't expect to hear from them. And they have a, they need to work on this from like a career development standpoint. This was a sales call. I'm like, what is it talking about? Where did that Her come from? Like, <laughs> took it as a given, like that would be really bad. So it's the same kind of thing where it's like, there is a human in the loop by definition, because you're summarizing it for someone internally. But like, I've asked ChatGPT about like retail tech companies who use generative AI and it, it made it made up companies. It told me like that one of the Amazon products was a company that had raised, it raised money. I was like, no, it, it hasn't. It was, I think that like the level of sensitivity to fact checking needs to go up a lot because we as a population are just terrible at fact checking in general, mm -hmm. clearly through all of this information and social media and stuff. So I think that like, Internally, companies need to have processes and protocols that explicitly define how things need to be fact checked internally before they're allowed to, you know, make decisions on this kind of stuff. Because otherwise, you might be taking information and acting on it er errantly and making million dollar mistakes. Yep. Yeah. And, and with all of the, the caution in perspective, the positive about that is it is transforming the way retail and shopping is happening today. As you pointed out, Ricardo, you, you could have thousands of customer feedback and reviews and all of that. And what this presents to a retailer is really the ability for personalizing that, where if I'm buying a car, for example, and I'm trying to compare a few, I could potentially have the feedback summarized for my mm -hmm. specific purpose. And when you're looking at it, it could be summarized for your specific purpose. So that level of scale is what it really brings. And I think that is huge in terms of transformation. Yeah. And I feel like I'm developing this reputation on this podcast as being the naysayer. And <laughs> Shish is like, no, no, it's not all that. Well, I'm with you. Like, <laughs> well, no, because I'm yeah. you know, the bear. <laughs> no, but well, speaking of like the core analogy, I think this is like, if we're talking about this example where you're using an LLM to like summarize for you millions of customer reviews. I'm not saying don't do it. It's like the car came along and replaced the horse-drawn carriage. You can get in high-speed car crashes and hurt yourself a lot more than you can in a horse-drawn carriage, but that doesn't mean you don't 
move to the yep. car. You right. need to be aware of what, right. like, the, how to be safe with it. And that's kind of what I was right. talking about with, like, the fact checking. Like, use it. Yes, it's awesome. But recognize where the risks are yep. as you would yeah. adopting yeah. a new form yeah, of training. There's a key point in there on with a lot of these tools, especially the ones that are connected to the internet is knowing where is it getting the information. So it's great that if I tell it, here's a source of 15,000 things, give me a summary and yep. it gives you a summary. Well, each of those summary points it gives you, obviously they came from one or more of those 15,000 things you fed it as an input. So it should be able to cite back to you with a link or with some sort of reference that you can backtrack into where that individual item came from. Yep. So then you, so that you at least know then where it's coming from. Even if it takes three of them and maybe it gives you a brand new interpretation of those three, you at least can go back and see how, well, how in the world did it come up with that conclusion? Well, I see because of these three things, right? Well, Ricardo, this is why you need to have carefully protected products. Uh, it goes back to the, pro yeah, no, that's absolutely that's right. That's all to say. Right. Well, yeah. information. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> This goes back to what Michelle pointed out earlier. Today, we kind of find facts on Facebook and everywhere else. And now it's being replaced by ChatGPT summarizing things. You don't know for sure where it came from. Right. But you're yeah. citing it as that's that's the source. And I think yeah. for some reason, I don't know if this is your experience as consumers, but my level of fact checking has gone up since interacting with the chat GPTs of the world relative to some random human on the internet that I know is just one person, mm -hmm. which is good because like the actual legitimacy of the source of information and stuff like that is like probably better on mm -hmm. the chat services than it is on like Facebook from some random person I've met yep. in high school or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think that might be a really good thing because some like it, it's really good 90% of the time and then 10% of the time is it completely throws up all over itself. That that is very different in terms of like my attitude towards fact checking the ninety percent or all every time I use it mm -hmm. than it is when it's just kind of always pretty bad, which is the social mm -hmm. the social media world. Like the level of disinformation yeah. or information is just kind of always at this like really kind of crappy like low level drone. Whereas in the ChatGPT and LLM world, it's really really good and then it's terrible. So like that that really big barbell kind of dichotomy makes me more apt to fact check when in mm -hmm. reality mis and disinformation is probably the same in each it's just the flavor of it is different and so i think that's a good thing i think like trust is going to be like the number one thing that can be won or lost from a brand over the next like 24 months and i don't know if you lose this trust because we've already been pretty thin on consumer trust over the last few years. I don't know if it's going to be something you can earn back. And I think it could be depending on how big, <laughs> what side of that you're on, whether or not you're on the really great side or the really horrible side could really have a major impact to a lot of brands that can't recover, that just literally can't recover from it. Michelle, I think it's, it's really interesting the way that you kind of brought that up. I think the first two weeks I had access to OpenAI and ChatGPT, and I've done the same thing with Bard from Google, is I've literally had conversations about things that I know inside and out, out of doubt, and had these conversations and asked where you're getting this information to get like, give me a baseline and really have these like, I, I mean, I've even said, if you wouldn't recommend this because of X, what if we were friends? Well, of course, if we were friends, then I could probably recommend you. I'm like, all right. So like you and I, like we're buddies. Like, what's your <laughs> let's be friends. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and just wow. kind of understanding where these baselines are when asking these questions. Because I was like, I can ask it questions, but I have no baseline. I needed to ask a whole bunch of things I already knew. And I knew for fact. <laughs> Yeah. And that goes back to the carefully crafted prompts, right? Telling it you're right. a friend, a different flavor than telling it, than not giving it that context. And you kind of have to be a little bit of like an expert in this stuff to know that you're going to get different yep. answers in those different ways of phrasing your question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's shift a little bit and talk a little more on the impact on the operational side of things in, in the retail business. So we've had a lot to say about what's consumer facing and customer facing. 
I mean, I would say we used to talk about predictive analytics and then prescriptive analytics was the big AI based upgrade when it came to a lot of operational aspects, but now we've got something completely different. So Michelle, let me start with you. I mean, where, where do you think is the, the most powerful benefit for retailers that's not consumer facing? I think fraud detection, this is totally not my area. So like I might be speaking out of school, but I think that just there's so much data to be consumed in terms of like orders, not even just like orders, but like checking to make sure this human actually exists, right? What are all those signals? However, I also think fraud detection is one of the big areas where you have to be a lot more careful about bias. Um, it's like the mortgage application flagging and stuff like that. There's just, it's really, really dangerous. You got to make sure you're using the right sources of data, consciously correcting for bias and all that kind of stuff. But I think it, if used correctly and if you're using the humans in the loop correctly in, in the internal organization, you probably level up the amount of, of, of catching of the actual quote unquote bad guys who are trying to do nefarious things with, with how they're making orders and stuff like that. So that's one area I think is really rich for this. And then the other one is like inspiration, just things internally where you, you're not really sure where to start and you just want to kind of kick off a process, especially around some of the visuals, which particularly because they're not ready for direct consumer prime time. Like you asked, we asked, I think it was diffusion or something, make us a banana Republic lookbook. And like some of this, it's like a Monet, right? In Clueless, like they talk about a Monet is from far away, it looks fine, but up close with a big old mess. That's exactly what you get. It was like, oh, okay, this is maybe plausible. And then you look close and you're like, wait a second, she's got seven fingers. Like what the <laughs> hell? Bring them like fingers. It's like that we're standing on end kind of thing to the max, right? So definitely not ready for consumer facing prime time without review, but could be really great for like creative teams internally just to be playing around with some stuff. Here's a pattern. Here's a, a feeling. Here's a, a like a word. Make me something that is that takes all this into the mix, right? That could be really cool. And it can kind of help you get further faster. And then the human creatives can like take that in different directions. And it helps you start from something that something rather than nothing. And we're playing in that space a little bit too which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, I've, I've really struggled on the creative piece of generative AI because I, I was an artist, I was a painter. I went to school for fashion design. I wanted my own collection. I had such a high respect for the artist and I would hate to see them disenfranchised. And I think that I've seen some incredible designs as a consumer that could never go to production. And so I do worry, you know, there's this way of empowering design teams and getting that inspiration, but then we can also be amplifying insecurities within our team that they're going to be replaced. They can't compete. Their ideas aren't good enough because some of this that I've seen so far is designing dreams that can never be realized. Some of the products like hand up, sign me up, send me it it would probably cost thirty thousand dollars to actually manufacture that nike jacket like it's insane but i love it but i'm not so excited about the new collection that came out because i've just seen all of these really cool things that i can't have yeah Yeah. (laughs) so i do think there's this this tread and i struggle because i want to play with it and i think it's cool and i want to adopt in so many of these ways but then i just feel so bad that i'm hurting the artists and that creative nature that I, I cherish it. I think it's beautiful. So Do you think there's a balance though between like, I'm less artistic than you, let's just clarify that right now. But is there a balance between like human the human creativity and helping those people in the organization that have those roles? Just the CEO, and- yeah. As a designer completely offended that my work would be changed the the sense of ownership and pride of seeing your creation hit a hanger there's there's this thing of making and i just as a ceo i'm like completely different opinion <laughs> and yep. i struggle so much on this because i can really relate to both sides yep. and i don't know if i could claim that i did this or be proud of it if i know i didn't do all of it well, I wonder if it's akin to sort of some of the 3D modeling and CAD design for products rather than creating a sample from scratch with your horn. Like that was a transition a lot of 
creatives went through. And a lot of people are like, they love the new paradigm. They're almost more creative and more productive and more like ownership end to end over the thing that they've built, working on it via computer, via CAD, via these 3D rendering technologies. Maybe it'll be something like that. I don't know. It's interesting. I think it's a transition, but I think it's I think it's going to be really interesting because it it is that creative process and ownership. And it kind of does come back to the prompt. If you're the creative designer and you have that idea, you can see it in your head. Yeah. And you're just trying to get it. Maybe the first draft of it created. If you had the ability to use these tools to give you that first draft and then you you see it now more visually than just in your head and you see it on paper, on screen, whatever the the medium. And now you say, okay, now I know what I need to fix. And yep. you go right. on and make it your own design. But it got you yeah. there 50% faster. Fine. Yeah. When you have that spark of inspiration, you can be like, there's like probably 50 things I need to do to paint in this paint by numbers that I have like to create the, the final thing. But I have like six in my head that just flash. It's the flash of inspiration. We mm-hmm. put it in we'll see what the machine fills out as the other like 40. What did I say? 44. And, yeah. and then just be like, ugh, gross. I hate that. Like yep. swipe away this big chunk of it but these four I'm going to keep and then you kind of iterate with it that's kind of how I've used it and I'm not not artistic I'm just not like a, a fashion designer at the level you are but I've, just, I've I've created jewelry before and and pottery and other artistic mediums where I'm like it's that what am I going to create and I know there's a there's two or three sparks there but it hasn't fully come together and I think something like this can help me kind of like narrow down on that because I know what I like when I see it and so if yeah. I get two or three more sparks I can get to that aha moment a little bit faster. That's where I feel like it's really starting. going to be great editors, right? And I think that that's always been a, a big problem in retail is yep. we're really bad at editing. We just don't, you don't go to school for editing. It's, it, <laughs> it has given a lot of companies a competitive advantage based on their editing skills. Yeah. So I think it's going to be really interesting. So from a internal perspective, what I see in, inside organizations, I kind of see the the huge benefit being, I think I mentioned that, which is removing the repetitive tasks and and all of those, I think, are the huge benefit that generative AI brings in. One of the things I'm, I'm really excited about is the combination of RPA and uh, generative AI, which is really using generative AI to define what's that next best action. What do I do at a personal level to engage with somebody? And then using RPA processes or automation to execute mm-hmm. on it. So that execution component and the generative AI component working together, I think that is an exciting area that a lot of organizations are looking at. One of the interesting examples is automation of interview processes. Today, many companies struggle with interviews at scale, where you have 3,000 applications coming in and you have to screen them. And that screening process, there are startups actually doing generative AI. There's a company called DeepBrain that's doing it, where they're creating a digital human. They are creating all the questions based on on the resume, doing the screening, summarizing each of the screenings, and then enabling the recruiters really to shortlist. So those are some interesting use cases that are showing up, including a couple of others that are removing the repetitive nature of things mm-hmm. and, and, and simplifying stuff with it. Yeah, so I, I think what's interesting, and particularly in that example that I see, most of these discussions on, in, I'll call it internal processes, always seem to start with, where can the AI make my process more efficient so that I in, improve my speed to whatever the conclusion is? And what, what I find is most interesting here is that uh, at least for now, it seems most of the, the practical use cases focus more on, and I'm going to choose to use the word filtering in early on in, in the process. And I say that because a lot of times these processes are lengthy right, for, for a person to take on because there's so much upfront information. So if you break something down into, let, let's say there's three steps in the process, there's I have all this information that's gathered up front. Then there's some kind of analysis, and then there's what conclusions do I draw from that that I take action on? Yeah. Well, it seems like the, the biggest improvement factor, at least right now, and, and I'm hedging on that because I'm sure it will get better yep. as the technology improves, but right now, that first step where you've got to consolidate the information, filter it, look through and figure out what are the, the most relevant pieces of information. I think that example is is great with the hiring process because you might have a thousand applicants for something, but you're really looking for the 10 best. 
how do I get from the 1000 down yep. to 10? And then I want to look at those 10 and decide, well, how do I, how can I analyze these 10 to understand what's special about each of the 10 and yep. do those things that make them special to that? How does that align to what I'm looking for yep. for this ultimately to fill this position? I, I think there's huge benefits there that could be seen now and, and potentially with less impact on the risk of the generative AI going off the rails in that part of the analysis, right? Where the, the hallucinations right, are, are less likely to happen, I think, in that part. Whereas if you apply it just on the analysis portion, there could be some information that's fed in that fools it into going in one direction versus another that it should go in, uh, which I'm sure, again, will get better over time. But I think there, there's so many use cases like that where I need to distill down that initial set and filter out what's relevant versus not quite as relevant. And Michelle, you mentioned fraud at the beginning. I think that's another really good one because that's the, the same thing, right? Where there is so much information you could pull in to try to understand, is there a fraud situation? But if you just had some help to filter out the noise and that to get to the pieces that really matter. And I think you're right in that case, you know, that, that is where bias comes in, particularly in fraud, that you have to be careful these systems don't overemphasize. When they, when they shouldn't be doing that, just to stick purely to the to the real part of the data. But I think that seems to be where there's a really big impact right now that retailers can be looking for in these internal processes. Where do I have lots of, of volume? I'm thinking in terms of forecasting, for example, and I'm trying to look at historical inventory data, right, to make a better forecast. I think that's one where there could be a huge advantage, but at the same time, there could be a little bit of risk, depending on what factors are you put it into the system for the AI to help you decide what to do next. Yeah, I think that I'd like to see how this plays with data scientists because they need to, they, I mean, they are prompt engineers, right? Essentially. And I've, I've had very large companies reach out for consulting and specifically to work with their data scientists to come up with sentences for them, for their queries. And I'm like, why are you calling me? You own 14 brands. You have 8,000 employees. Call your store manager. <laughs> this is at your flagship or something, right? Like, why are you reaching out for this? You own the knowledge already. But even at that, like, data scientist level, they may lack the retail experience and the contacts yeah. that might be able to be pulled through to get to those answers within their own organization and data sets. There's no shortage of admin work in retail. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think also like the other, the reverse is true. Like data scientists probably aren't going to fall into this trap nearly as often because they're data scientists, but the trap of right. correlation, confusing correlation and causation, the mm -hmm. average business user does that all the time. The average person does that all the time. Even data scientists fall into it accidentally. Like people trained in statistics who know better, just kind of ha human behavior takes over sometimes and you, you conf conf confound those two things. And I think when you're at doing filtering or when you're asking a question of the large language model and you get a response, it's not, unless you engineer the prompt exactly correctly, going to give you an answer that is going to clarify or disclaim this might be correlation, not causation. And then we'll make a, a business decision based on that. And it's like, it might have been something else that was causing this. I remember one of my, one of my previous roles, I was doing a, a joint venture like acquisition thing. And one of the kind of key model assumptions was around the company's ability to reprice in specific moments in time based on a, a specific metric. And so... You know, I got, just was out of business school. I, I know how to use R or Minitab or like my statistical packages. Didn't have any of that. So I'm using Excel. Like Excel doesn't do a great job of kind of transforming data that's not normalized into normalized and can give you kind of crazy answers. And so I like did it in Excel and I did it in like R or Minitab or one of the applications that does that. And I looked at the results and like one said like, yes, you can reprice. The other one said, no, you can't. And I was like, well, what do I do? This is a really now big what? difference. Correlated <laughs> 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 one side with causal, and I was like, "Oh shit, what do I do? I'm like, like going to tell the CEO to make a hundred million dollar decision based on this, and I don't know what the answer is." So, like, and I, I, I caught it. But how many times is it not caught? Right? How many times are we making it as leaders decisions that impact millions of dollars or thousands of jobs or whatever it might be? 
And it's correlation or causation. And again, going back to the carefully worded prompts, most people don't know. I don't even know how to write that prompt. I know I know that I should be asking that, but how do I actually write that prompt to make sure that the answer I get is at least telling me if it's not causal, there's some kind of correlation, but it could be spurious. Like, watch We're out. Pretty. Like, how do you check your work? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think a lot of times the systems that we've had in retail in general have not gain trust of users and it's kept us in excel for a much longer period of time because at the end of the day if i don't believe if i'm off by like a fraction of a penny in my system versus in my excel file i can run and i know and i will trust that my excel file is right over a system that had a crappy integration and took two years and nobody uses it anyway and we just export to excel you know and i think there is an innate lack of trust even for users to trust something that they haven't shown their work mm -hmm. and, and ricardo kind of pointed out this earlier where there is reviews and validation that happens uh, when i was having the standard ai conversations a couple of years ago many of the decision makers said the ai models are black boxes they're recommending certain decisions that are a million dollar decision. And do I just trust that AI model or mm -hmm. do I have experts review that decision before I make it? So I think that kind of applies across the board, whether it's generative AI or any kind of AI or any kind of model out there where you, there is a, some level of expertise that is reviewing it and auditing those decisions and not just blind. I, I think. We're not ready for autonomous systems yet. Yeah. yeah. I think that like that, the, the questioning of it, wanting to crack open, open the back black box does not necessarily mean you don't trust that like the AI got the math right. The yep. math is probably much more likely to be right than in a human read in Excel. Right. It's the inputs, exactly. Yeah. It's like, yeah. did your assumptions line up with reality or is something amiss or missing? And then even with your arithmetic or your math is correct, garbage in, garbage out. Like right. that's where you have to right. shift the attention to now. Because a lot of people are like, oh, well, like, of course the AI is right. Yes, like the math is right. I don't doubt that that's mm -hmm. 90 yep. true in most cases. It's not the math we're concerned about. That's kind of the mental exactly. shift. In yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's interesting adding for as many jobs as people fear that it will replace. I think there's an opportunity here to create a lot of new jobs that are much more higher thinking. Yep. Really more yeah. strategy focused. It could be very interesting yeah. to change that workflow. Yeah, I, I think the we hadn't touched on uh, as much as I expected we would in this issue of the potential for job loss versus job creation that this technology brings. But if, I, I would argue that if we look historically at just about any major technology shift, right? There, there are always a loss of jobs in any new technology shift because the, let's face it, the, the why are so many technologies created? And they're oftentimes created because there's a little bit of a desire to eliminate tasks and, and job functions that we believe to be less desirable on the theory that if you eliminate them, you open the door to those same individuals doing something that they may enjoy more or do or be better at. So the, the hope is always that that new technology, while it will eliminate certain roles, it creates new ones that are more interesting in some aspects. And hopefully the net new you know, result is that you've created more than you've eliminated. It always remains to be seen in any technology, right, whether that comes true or not. And I, I expect fully that we'll see umpteen analysis that will be just like the old joke about how if you lined up every economist in, in the world to tell you what direction the economy is going, they'd point in every direction. It's that kind of thing where you'll, you'll get every study will give you a different result and you'll never know which is which until it actually happens. So I think we, we literally have to do a wait and see on that one. One thing that I, I haven't heard anyone touch on yet, and I think this one to me is a little interesting, so it's worth maybe spending a few moments on, is the impact on sustainability with this new technology. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't get a lot of news coverage, but the actual systems involved that power the processing for all of these generative AI systems are pretty complex and pretty large. And so we used to all hear stories about how the horrors of, of 
crypto technology and how it made everything so unsustainable. So, but how does generative AI compare? Are, are we once again doing the same thing and taking a step forward and trying to be more sustainable, but then taking two steps back while we automate the world? And I feel like I got to let Shish answer this one because I, I don't know about data servers and data centers and stuff like that. But Microsoft knows a lot more about that than I do. But yeah, I, I think about that a lot. That like, are we shifting ways of being more sustainable that are enabled by these large language models and complex processing? We're just taking that cost and we're shifting it to servers and hosting. Yeah, in a way, I think it's like the EVs, when it goes above a certain number of EVs out there, the load is just shifting where you're not burning gas in your car anymore, but you have all these production facilities that is, that is not very sustainable. And I think there's a similar kind of thing happening with every kind of technology out there. I think the compute power needed for all of this is massive. I was just looking at the numbers for ChatGPT, for example. It's close to a million a day is what they spend on compute. And that is massive. And we're just getting started. So once the, the use cases get to scale, we're talking about spending a lot more on compute. And so I think that concern about the shift, and I think in everything we're doing, we are moving the sustainability from one aspect to another. So the argument here could be, we probably are going to be using a lot fewer people to do tasks, but at the same time, we're going to use a lot more compute. And that sustainability goes from all of the commute and the people resources to compute resources. So I think it's still a question on whether we are, from a sustainability perspective, are we getting any better or is it about the same? And I think that same argument with EVs once it goes above a, a certain number, the, the large amount of EVs in every city it taxes the grid as much mm -hmm. as it would impact from fossil fuels. Coming for, back to the job. For listeners that aren't very familiar, can you just touch on quickly what type of like environmental impact do the do servers and data consumption have on the environment? Like is there? Like, what, what is one, one is definitely power. The power consumption for all of those taxes the grid. And, and the other aspect of it is the, the cooling. A lot of these require GPUs and they require massive cooling systems. So that, again, is another aspect of power and, and impact to the environment as well, all those cooling systems out there. And I think that was a big challenge with crypto as well. It was the, the heat, the cooling, the, the compute, the power requirements. A lot of times the power requirements were more expensive than what you would make mining crypto. <laughs> so. Can I ask a dumb question that can be edited out if appropriate? <laughs> if it's making so much heat and heat can create energy, as in the case of nuclear reactors, mm -hmm. can some of these data centers become self-sustaining from a, a point? That's an interesting, That's interesting, interesting question. Uh, whether it can be repurposed, recycled, yeah, recycled. that heat could be. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, it's kind I of like know, regenerative this... braking in a car. Exactly. I right. the original Tesla was working on that. Was <laughs> 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 But I think that's like maybe like the next fertile ground for some of the innovations. Yeah, like, exactly. I don't feel bad the generation of kids that we told to go learn how to code in school. You don't need a code anymore. Just tell the dead why what you want to do it for you. But you used to, to be a engineer, a semiconductor engineer, and like a nuclear engineer, like a nuclear physicist to figure out how to capture this, like heat that's coming out of yeah. data center and use it for energy. Mm -hmm. Like poor kid. Yeah, so new old brushes, hardware. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can say that that one is a sort of related. As someone who graduated with an electrical engineering degree, there once upon a time when you went into electrical engineering, you were learning about power systems and how to generate the electricity in the power grid. And that's what that meant. It event, it, by the time I graduated, so it was more about how you write code and how you yep. <laughs> use computers and design computing systems rather than, than the power system. But now it kind of feels like we're coming back around to where let's hope that there are people who are studying how to create new power systems, right? And how to, because it all comes down to, to that. And I think that was a great point, Michelle, actually is, you know, is, who is, is anyone looking at how you can recover those, those heat losses? Uh, we usually look at heat, right, as something that dissipates 
an energy from an energy source rather than something that can be used to generate exactly. an energy source. So that's that's an I think it's an interesting it's thing. startup. Yeah, that's an you just created another startup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the time on my hands. <laughs> If you need to get anything done, put it on the person who has the busiest plate. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then with, with all of you, I think we've we've covered a lot of ground across both consumer facing areas, internal facing areas. I think there wasn't a single one of those where we didn't hit on the risks and cautions involved in those, which is probably an interesting in and of itself. But I guess maybe the the the, the way to close this out maybe is to think about what are you most excited about the future of generative AI? So for me, I think, go on, Michelle. Go okay. on. Mine's yeah. going to be selfish and self-serving. <laughs> like, <laughs> what my mind does, it's like we're helping brands and retailers who have like a specific brand focus and need to differentiate from one another, helping them take advantage of these opportunities and not get commoditized in the process and not just shift that that manual work from place A to place B to place C and not really get the full value out of it. And that's that's what that's why I started the company so many years ago. That's what gets me up every morning, gets me excited about what we're building. And that's only accelerated with all this new technology promise that's come to the table because I've seen so many other technology shifts where it's like the big thing is here. And then the component underlying pieces to allow that, that new technology to be the success that it should be weren't attended to. And that's really our place in this space. So, but like I said, it's self-serving. So let's just close it out. Play out a more, I don't know, help being, help humanity level. Yep. <laughs> we all got to make it work here, you know? <laughs> for, for me, I, th I think one of the things that stands out is this is uh, pretty much that iPhone moment in, in tech, and there is a lot of transformation that is happening. So everything that we talked about, where it is transforming retail, the way shoppers are engaging with brands, the way they everything is personalized, all of that. But I think we're still at the tip of that transformation. There's a lot happening. And many of the conversations I'm having with brands is around brainstorming ideas. And I think one big element that I see here is there's a lot of creativity happening on, on bringing up creative use cases for generative AI. And not everything has been discovered yet in terms of what can you do in terms of use cases. Every, every week or so, I'm hearing of new use cases that startups are coming up with of, of transforming ways things are done today. And that's going to continue for a while. So that is, I think, to me, extremely exciting about what else can I make with this? What can I create? What can I dream up with generative AI? And I think that aspect of it is extremely exciting. There's a lot happening. There's going to be a lot happening going forward. And we're going to hear some really exciting stuff just with generative AI. Casey, how about you? I'm really excited for speed and uh, the deletion of the mundane so people can focus yeah. on big ideas mm -hmm. and solving yeah. really big problems. I want to work in 2023 and not 1992. And mm -hmm. I think yeah. just has a long <laughs> way to go to pick up speed. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, well, for me, I think sim similar to what Shish said, I think it's that uh, we're, we're just scratching the surface. So we haven't really seen yet what the the that final big moment is going to be i think there's so much experimentation going on in a good way i, I agree that this is like an iphone moment i mean i i have said before another place i think this is probably the the biggest transformation in retail since the barcode and the iphone and, and yeah i do stretch far back enough to go to call it out the barcodes i think that was a, a huge one for retailers that one had an impact for retailers. The iPhone impacted it for consumers. Uh, and I think maybe the most telling thing is there's two telling things. One is that it's a normal part of conversation to talk about the days pre-iPhone and, and the days since. Everyone just accepts that as a, as a phrase. I think this is one of those where we're going to talk about the, the pre-AI era. It's not going to be about the AI that we've been talking about the last few years. It's, it's this. It's this moment now that we're going to be referencing as the pre-AI era versus the, the, the AI era. And I think what's really going to be interesting is that whatever the, the one big thing that does change the most in retail, I suspect, 
will come from someone that is as creative with this technology as that they're, they're coming at it from outside of retail. It'll be someone who does something. In some ways, you can argue the iPhone was like that, right? The iPhone came out from someone that, from a place that was not intended for retail, but look at the impact it had on it. And I think this will be similar. We're going to see the most creative changes come from people outside of retail who do something that gets applied to retail and really transforms things. Yeah. And with that, we've only scratched the surface of AI and generative AI and retail. So join us next time for another thought-provoking conversation in our automation and AI theme this season. And thanks to you, Michelle and Shish, for joining us today. This was a fantastic discussion. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Thanks to the plenty of you guys, as always. And until next time, for everyone, you know, keep your curiosity ignited and minds open to all of the incredible possibilities of generative AI. And on that positive note, and potentially terrifying, <laughs> Ricardo, this discussion is a wrap. If you enjoyed our show, please consider giving us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And remember to smash that subscribe button in your favorite podcast player or on your YouTube channel so you don't miss a minute. If you want to know more about what we talked about today, take a look at the show notes for handy links and more deets. And be sure to sign up for our new Substack newsletter. I'm your co-host, Casey Golden. If you'd like to connect with us and share your feedback, follow us on Twitter at KCC Golden and Ricardo underscore Belmar, or find us on LinkedIn. You can follow the show on Twitter and LinkedIn at Retail Razor for the latest updates. And if you want even more from us, as Casey said, be sure and check out and subscribe to our new Substack newsletter. I'm your host, Ricardo Belmar. Thanks for joining us. And remember, there's never been a better time to be in retail if you cut through the clutter. Until next time, this is the Retail Razor Show.